This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Israeli tanks, bulldozers, and helicopters raided the city of Ramallah yesterday. They were confronted by Palestinian gunmen. The operation killed four people and wounded 15 others, seven in critical condition. The goal behind the raid was to arrest or kill members of Al-Aqsa Marauders brigades. Prominent leader known as Rabi'i Hamid was wounded, along with the Ajans France Press and Palestinian newspaper Al-Ayam photographer Shadi al -Aruri. Dozens of young men gathered around a sign put up at the hospital's entrance. Some were relieved after reading it. Others were overwhelmed with grief upon learning of the death of a brother or a friend who may have been walking with them hours earlier. Their names ended up on this list, which contains the names of the victims of Israeli aggression on the city of Ramallah. Israeli military cars stormed the Menara area in central Ramallah and proceeded to open fire indiscriminately on civilians, killing at least two and wounding more than 20, including a photographer. The injuries have been described as critical, mostly in the head and the chest. All of a sudden, there was random shooting at us by Israeli soldiers and special forces. Most of the wounded, I would say more than half of them, are in critical condition. The operation, which lasted for more than an hour, targeted an Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade's member. When the operation was discovered, bulldozers helped Israeli forces out of the city, causing much destruction and devastation to the streets and cars. Israeli helicopters hovered in the sky and opened fire. This is all came after talk, a preliminary negotiation between Palestinians and Israelis on a number of issues. The big question now is where will these negotiations go? The surprise Israeli attack comes after a talk of ceasefire and promises by Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert to the Palestinian president of more concessions and an end to assassinations. At a time when Palestinians are themselves in conflict conflict with each other, they are also being killed by Israeli gunfire. Whether killed or martyred, the end result is the same. It's a major loss and a heavy price paid by those looking for their security and safety. In front of the Ramallah Public Hospital, Abdel Hafiz Jawan, Al Arabiya, the Palestinian territories. شهدت بلدة بلعين في الضفة الغربية اشتباكات عنيفة بين متظاهرين فلسطينيين وقوات الاحتلال The West Bank town of Belayin witnessed violent clashes between Palestinian demonstrators and the Israeli occupation forces. Palestinians organized demonstrations in Belayin this afternoon to protest the construction of the separation wall around Palestinian towns and villages in the West Bank. We are looking at images from the Belayin area of the clashes that took place between Israeli occupation forces and Palestinian demonstrators, protesting the separation wall, which isolated many Palestinian citizens from their lands. Israeli peace activists also participated in these demonstrations. A lot of people were injured when the occupation forces responded in a violent manner. بعد أن تصدت لها قوات الاحتلال بشكل عنيف
وفي رام الله خيمت أجواء الحزن بعد يوم من استشهاد. An atmosphere of sadness overshadowed Ramallah after four Palestinians were martyred and at least 25 others were injured during an Israeli military operation that was considered the most violent since July 2006. Palestinian store owners closed their businesses in Ramallah in protest and streets were empty except for some passersby. Israeli forces backed by helicopters and armored vehicles raided Ramallah yesterday and opened fire before occupying the Manara Square area. The Israeli forces destroyed Palestinian infrastructure and destroyed a number of parked cars. An atmosphere of caution overshadowed the Gaza Strip following the meeting that took place between President Mahmoud Abbas and Prime Minister Ismail Haniyeh. The two agreed to stop the current crisis between Fatah and Hamas and use dialogue to resolve disputes. The two leaders also agreed to form an independent investigation committee to look into the latest events. Meanwhile, thousands of Palestinians held funeral processions for five out of eight Palestinians who were killed yesterday in northern Gaza. Palestinians condemned the continuation of the bloody events and demanded that Palestinian factions end their disputes and concentrate on confronting the Israeli occupation. The funeral procession ended without any incidents. Palestinian Prime Minister Ismail Haniyeh said that he is in agreement with President Mahmoud Abbas that the real war is with the Israeli occupation, which continues its military operations in the West Bank. The Israeli occupation of Ramallah and the raid of Tul Karim today is a message to all the Palestinian people that the battle is not an internal one, it is with the occupation forces. Therefore, I emphasize that the President and I have agreed on this in yesterday's meeting. In our top story, Qassam rocket fired Israel continued today with two missiles fired from northern Gaza slamming into the southern part of the country. One of the missiles landed on a main road in the town of Sterot, damaging multiple homes. Several people were treated for shock. One woman fainted and was taken to hospital. The second rocket landed in an open field close to a nearby kibbutz, but there were no injuries. The military wing of the Islamic Jihad claimed responsibility for the attacks, saying that they came in response to yesterday's IDF operation in Ramallah. Last night, a Qassam rocket landed close to the Arras crossing point, but again, there were no injuries or damage caused. A tense summit last night between Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak and Prime Minister Ehud Olmert in the Egyptian resort town of Sharm el-Sheikh. IBA's diplomatic correspondent Leia Zinder, who accompanied the Prime Minister, says that yesterday's violent clash in Ramallah overshadowed the talks. Even before the two leaders spoke at their joint press conference in Sharm el-Sheikh last night, their stiff faces, President Mubarak's frown and their tense body language said louder than any words their meeting had been a tough one. The IDF raid in Ramallah just an hour earlier that ended up killing four Palestinians and injuring 12 others had cast a dark shadow over the meeting. Mubarak began by saying, I expressed to the Prime Minister our indignation at what happened and told him that Israel and all the people in the region will achieve peace only by refraining from all practices which obstruct its course. Olmert apologized for the deaths of civilians, but he pointed out the operation was aimed at detaining terrorists responsible for the death of Israeli citizens. Olmert also stressed Israel's continued restraint in the face of ongoing Qassam rocket fire from Gaza in violation of the so-called ceasefire, to which Mubarak rebutted, saying, quote, these Qassam rockets, they'll fire them every day or two. Must we stop the peace process because one or two individuals fire rockets? Olmert for his part had a lukewarm response to Mubarak's idea of holding a four-way regional summit of Israeli, Palestinian, Egyptian and Jordanian leaders. Any meeting in any combination, including of course the four of us, uh, will be very uh, helpful to create a necessary environment uh, for a progress uh, between uh, us and the Palestinians uh, towards uh, an agreement and peace between us. 
The two leaders met for close to an hour and a half in a private tete-a-tete -tete with no aides present. There was no word of any significant breakthrough in attempts to free captured IDF soldier Gilad Shalit. But Omar did stress his determination to break the deadlock with the Palestinians. Israel has restrained itself in order to help create this environment of uh, peace that is so important. If the terrorist actions will end, it will certainly contribute towards the environment which is uh, essential for uh, the uh, uh, fruitful negotiations between us and the Palestinians. An Egyptian journalist asked the Prime Minister about his controversial comment in Berlin that Israel has nuclear weapons. Olmert responded with a stock Israeli response that Israel will not be the first to introduce nuclear weapons into the Middle East. But then Mubarak stepped in and made a comment that could be construed as ominous when he said, quote, We don't want nuclear weapons, but since they appear highly present in the region, we must defend ourselves. Certainly part of Mubarak's hardline statements may be attributed to his considerable opposition at home. Nonetheless, their private talks belied everything that had been said in public, and one may assume that the summit did little to raise the spirits of an increasingly beleaguered prime minister. The Palestinians gave a big build-up to tonight's summit, saying it would end with a dramatic announcement on the imminent release of Gilad Shalit. There was absolutely no sign of that in the rather frosty atmosphere between the two leaders here tonight. So either they're really good poker players or the excruciating process of negotiation is going to have to continue. Leia Zinder for IBA News in Sharm el-Sheikh. More than 11,000 families of Palestinian prisoners live in difficult humanitarian conditions and they have little confidence in the current negotiations over the prisoners' exchange deal. They are also prohibited from visiting their loved ones in the occupation prisons. All this is added to the poor health and living conditions that these prisoners must endure inside these jails. The stories of the Palestinian prisoners' families have become increasingly bitter as the number of prisoners continues to increase in occupation jails. Abu Hussein Sarafidi is a former prisoner. Two of his sons were martyred. His third and only remaining son has been sentenced to prison for 16 years. This father and many others like him have little hope that their sons will be freed. They have lost confidence in all the promises made by the Zionist entity. I was imprisoned even before my children became prisoners and martyrs. My son is imprisoned and the two others have been martyred. My house was so full and then all of a sudden it was so empty. This was very difficult for me and my wife. The Israelis do not have pure intentions to release the prisoners. The mother of the prisoner, Ali, described with bitterness and pain the living conditions of Palestinian prisoners in the occupation jails. They endure extreme torture and are prohibited from receiving medical treatment. Her own living conditions are no less miserable because her three sons have been either imprisoned or martyred. You're asking me about the conditions of the prisoners? They're suffering. I wish that the whole world could see the conditions of the prisoners. Hundreds of times the mothers call for and appeal for the prisoners. However, it has been five years since Abu Musa Badawi saw his son Musa, who was sentenced to jail for 26 years. He lives amongst these pictures and memorabilia. His home has become a place where companions and loved ones gather, but only through these pictures. Five years. I haven't seen him for five years. He was sentenced to 26 years. I should be allowed to at least communicate with my son to visit and see him. There are many prisoners' stories behind these pictures and images. Their stories include being taken from their homes, the suffering of their families, and they conclude with them being put behind bars. We do not know how those tales will end for 11,000 Palestinian prisoners, and we do not know the person who will end their stories, but his name will last throughout history. Isra al-Hasi, al-Alam, Gaza, Palestine.
قالت الأمم المتحدة إنها تحقق في مزاعم بأن جنودا لحفظ السلام. The United Nations said it is investigating allegations that UN peacekeepers and civilian personnel were sexually abusing children in South Sudan and added that it is ready to undertake strong disciplinary action. The spokesperson for the UN Secretary General, Michel Montas, said a permanent committee was set up in Sudan to investigate the allegations of sexual abuse. In Khartoum, Ali al sadek the spokesperson for the Sudanese Foreign Ministry, expressed his country's deep concern after hearing that underage girls were being sexually assaulted in South Sudan. The Daily Telegraph's report is very disturbing and it is making many people angry. The national unity government will not remain silent about this matter and will conduct the necessary investigations into everyone who might have a connection with the incidents, particularly the United Nations peacekeepers, until we find out the truth of what happened. The law will pursue its course with those who committed these heinous crimes. Shortly after the new UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon assumed his position, a new crisis loomed on the horizon after the British Daily Telegraph accused UN personnel of sexually abusing children in South Sudan. The newspaper said that these assaults may have started two years ago, coinciding with the UN peacekeeping mission's arrival in South Sudan to help with the reconstruction process after the civil war that lasted for two years decades. The allegations, some of which came in a UNICEF internal report, are based on testimonies by 20 victims who said that both soldiers and employees would pick up children on Juba Street and that hundreds were sexually abused. According to the newspaper, the United Nations refused to comment on the allegations, but the Sudanese government announced for its part that it had collected evidence, including a videotape showing Bengali soldiers having sex with underage girls. The UN peacekeeping mission was deployed in Sudan in the beginning of 2005. It includes 10,000 soldiers, police officers and civilian employees from about 70 countries. News of the incidents is following UN peacekeeping missions wherever they go in the world. The international organization has so far recorded more than 300 incidents in the last two years. The Iraqi Ministry of Defense has opened the doors to the soldiers and officers of the former Iraqi regime to join the new army. Mohammed Alskari, the advisor of the Iraqi Ministry of Defense, said that his ministry has adopted a new mechanism, allowing the army to rehire as many former soldiers as needed. The ministry also drafted new laws, making it unlawful for members of the Iraqi army to bid loyalty to any sectarian or political groups. Mufid Al-Lami reports. In accordance with the National Reconciliation Initiative, the Iraqi Ministry of Defense opened the doors to soldiers and officers of the former regime to rejoin the new army. The ministry has adopted a new mechanism to rehire as many former army officers and soldiers as possible. If some officers do not get picked up by the Ministry of Defense, they will be either rehired at other ministerial positions or allowed to take early retirement with pension funds. We have adopted a three-phase mechanism. In the first phase, we will try to accommodate the maximum number of recruits from all ranks, keeping in mind the army needs and requirements. Under the current circumstances, the army is looking to fill in several low-ranking positions, including lieutenant colonel, officer and cadet positions. However, most high-ranking positions are currently filled. In the second phase, if the Minister of Interior was unable to accommodate all candidates, those who were turned down will be allowed to join some other departments, such as the newly developed Army Reserve Department or the Department of Veteran Affairs. 
In the third phase, those who have reached certain ages or do not wish to rejoin the army will be allowed to get an early retirement with a pension fund. The mechanism, which was endorsed by the Iraqi parliament and the office of the prime minister, is currently at the desk of the National Assembly for approval. Meanwhile, the Iraqi people welcomed this newly developed mechanism, saying that the Ministry of Defense must make sure that all applicants are not affiliated with any groups, and they are only dedicated to defend and protect their nation. I think this move was a positive step in the right direction, because it will unite the Iraqi people. The former soldiers of the Iraqi army were running the country at one point, and we never had problems like the ones we are having today. Some former army officers may have bid loyalty to Saddam's regime due to fear or pressure. Anyone under certain circumstances may be pressured to do something that they do not want to do. The bottom line, we need these veterans to rejoin the army because they have what it takes to bring the country back on track. However, all candidates must show loyalty to the nation and not to certain sectarian or political groups. Their job is to defend the nation and protect and serve the citizens. Otherwise, they will take us back to square one. In addition to the current laws, the Ministry of Defense also enacted new ones in order to ensure that the loyalty of the former soldiers and officers will be only to the Iraqi army. The Ministry of Defense is requesting all army recruits to sign an affidavit confirming that they are not affiliated with any political group. In addition, all candidates must possess and carry an Iraqi identification card. Anyone violating this agreement will be criminally liable and subject to disciplinary action. Anyone who is proven to be involved in any sectarian or political organizations or parties will not be allowed to continue their work at the ministry. The Ministry of Defense requested that all officers with major or below major ranks should report to army recruitment centers. It requested that army cadets report to recruitment centers in various Iraqi provinces to fill out the necessary documents allowing them to rejoin the new Iraqi army. The International Federation of Journalists described 2006 as the deadliest year for journalists and media professionals after 177 journalists were killed, mostly in Iraq. The fourth authority, journalism, is often described as the most difficult profession. Journalists who have made it their mission to search for truth have now become targets by people who are afraid of what may be revealed. In 2006, 177 journalists and media professionals have fallen victims to truth and freedom of expression, including 155 people who died as a result of criminal kidnappings and assassinations while they were working. Meanwhile, the 22 others were killed in various incidents, making 2006 the absolute deadliest year for journalists. Iraq remains the most dangerous place for journalists. 68 journalists were killed, including 19 people who died as a result of U.S. occupation forces gunfire, thus bringing the total number of martyred journalists to 170 since the start of the U.S. invasion in April 2003. Aidan White, the Secretary General of the International Federation of Journalists said that the families of these victims are still waiting for credible and independent reports about what happened to their loved ones. According to the International Federation of Journalists, the Philippines was the second most dangerous place for media professionals, where 13 journalists were killed out of a total of 34 in Asia. Third was Mexico, where 10 journalists were killed out of a total of 37 journalists who died in Latin America. The International Federation of Journalists, which revealed these realities, said it can do nothing more than condemn these acts and that most of the people who committed these crimes have gone unpunished. Saddam was executed on the Muslim holiday of sacrifice. Why was his execution rushed? And will this lead to more violence in Iraq? These stories and more on Link TV's Mosaic Intelligence Report.
There seems to be a lot of concern about the last two minutes of Saddam Hussein's life and less about the first 69 years in which he murdered hundreds of thousands of people. This is what White House spokesman Tony Snow said after the execution of Saddam Hussein. A morbid event that was watched by millions of people around the world on TV sets and on the web. Saddam was basically hanged for ordering the killing of 148 Shiite men and boys in the village of Dujail. This was in reprisal for an assassination attempt that took place there in July 1982. This rushed execution meant that there would be no accounting for his other crimes. The destruction of the marshes and the marsh Arabs in the 1990s. The murder of tens of thousands of Shiites in the aftermath of the 1991 uprising. The killing of 8,000 members of the Barzani clan in 1983. The 1990 invasion of Kuwait and the murder of tens of thousands in various purges over his decades in power. The reason for the rush to hanging? Well, there are many theories ranging from the obvious revenge to the conspiracy theorists who claim that Prime Minister Maliki feared a last-minute escape arranged by the Americans and the Jordanians. Nevertheless, the manner of Saddam's execution made it clear that Iraq's Shiite leaders, and in particular Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, were more interested in revenge than in justice. But for millions of Muslims who watched the hanging on the day of the Eid al-Adha feast, a day of forgiveness, Saddam's execution will go down as an American affair. According to them, America has executed an Arab leader who no longer obeyed his orders from Washington. What said is that uh, he is being accorded all of the rights of a prisoner of war. He is being treated in accordance with the Geneva Convention, and we will continue to do so. Meanwhile, the same TV networks that played the images of a day's Saddam over and over again, crawling out of a foxhole, dirty, unshaved, and afraid, now these TV networks have transformed his image again by mercilessly replaying the video of his hanging as he walked defiantly to the gallows. They turned him from a mass murderer into a martyr. Many have feared that Saddam Hussein's execution would lead to more violence. But if it did, how would we tell? There is more and more violence in Iraq with each passing month. Almost 2,000 civilians were killed in December, according to Iraq's Interior Ministry. At least 112 U.S. soldiers died in December, the deadliest month for American troops in more than two years, pushing the total number of U.S. soldiers killed in Iraq above 3,000. In his final minutes, one of Saddam Hussein's executioners shouted, Go to hell, Saddam! Saddam replied cynically, You mean today's Iraq? I'm Jamal Dajani for Mosaic Intelligence Report. To learn more about this program or to share your thoughts, visit us at linktv.org slash mosaic. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, and by committed Link TV viewers like you. If you value this program, Please send your tax deductible contribution to Link TV, either through the website or the mailing address listed on your screen.
This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.